Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Baumbacher, the director of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. Welcome to the fourth installment of a six-part Thursday Night Live series. I see we have some regulars who are here tonight, so welcome back. So good to see you. Tonight, I'm very excited about tonight. We're going to be bicycling with, butterf with, bi with, bicycling with butterflies. There we go. In just a few minutes, but first let me uh, set some rules and, and, and share some information about the Schuylkill Center and people are still signing on, which is great. So again, I mentioned this is a six part series. For the second year, we're gonna be celebrating Earth Day together live over Zoom. So we've got um, next week's Thursday Night Live. Um, actually, if you look down on the list of people, Aliyah Green Ross is our wonderful director of education. She and I will be co-hosting next week. And we've got a, a special edition of Thursday Night Live. So we'll be celebrating Earth Day together for an hour and a half. Uh, we've got three different discrete chunks of things that we'll be doing. And in between the three different things, we're going to be unveiling the top 10 environmental movies of all time as voted by the staff of the Schuylkill Center. So you'll learn about Bird Safe Philly, a program to reduce bird strikes in the city um, with large buildings. Um, we've got a lot of things going on. Um, native plants, edible native plants that we're selling for you. So we do have a native plant sale that's incredibly popular, but we will be doing um, an edible edition of native plants. And then uh, Adam Rose, a historian, wrote a book called The Genius of Earth Day, about the history of the Earth Day and why uh, it's so important. So The Genius of Earth Day, Edible Native Plants, Birds Save Philly, the top 10 environmental movies of all time, and some other things uh, with me and Aaliyah one week. Uh, so we'll hopefully see you all back next Thursday for Earth Day. Um, and actually Nature Palooza, our big Earth Day festival is then Saturday after that. So Saturday the 23rd, um, uh, we'll be celebrating at a family festival on Earth Day as our largest one day event. We're very excited when Nature Palooza comes by. And the day in between Thursday and Saturday, of course, is Friday, April 22nd. That is the Earth Day. And with our nature preschool, we'll be planting trees in what we call the Earth Day forest. So each day, each year, nature preschool kids plant uh, a tree in uh, for their class, with their class in the Earth Day forest. So we have a big Earth Day coming up next week. We're very excited. Some Zoomy rules, which I'm sure you all know, we actually are recording this already. The recording is gonna be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you go to the YouTube, you can actually search for the Schuylkill Center and you can find all these Thursday Night Lives, uh, ones that you may have missed and wanted to see. So do check those out. Uh, do keep your microphone on mute. Uh, turn off your video if you don't wanna be visible. Of course, it's your call. Uh, we will be screen sharing uh, with Sarah. So use the side-by-side -side view so you can see both she and the slides. And um, Sarah's gonna be taking your questions during the end. So at any point in the evening, feel free to put a question or a comment in chat and I'll read them to her when we get to that portion. So any point, throw in questions in chat and I'll remind you of that as we get into it. Um, if you're new to the Schuylkill Center, we're in the Northwest corner of Philadelphia, four miles of trails on 300 plus acres of forest. We're free, come for a walk anytime. Love to have you. It's a great time of year. Our ephemeral spring wallflowers are out right now. Ask the front desk where you can see red trillium um, and you want to check that out. We have the best stand of uh, ephemeral spring wildflowers in the city of Philadelphia, so don't miss that. It's a narrow window of time. We are a nature center that's been doing environmental education programming of all kinds uh, for more than 50 years now, we're proud to say. As I mentioned, we operate nature preschool um, where our three, four, five-year-olds are outside every day, all day. Uh, it's just been a great tonic for them and an antidote for them in the pandemic these last two years. So Nature Preschool is one of our core programs. Um, we have an environmental art program um, that's uniquely wonderful uh, among nature centers even in the country. And the new show is called Companions and the opening reception has a foraging walk. Um, again, edible plants, a, a little theme going through here on April 16th. So do check out the new show called Companions. Um, when you look at these artworks through different filters, you will see different things, um, including in one of them, one of the filters will show you animals that no longer live in a Pennsylvania forest. So it's really uh, quite interesting when you see, you'll see different things with the red filter than you will with the blue filter. And it'll be inside and outside uh, our art gallery. Um, for the last year, we've had a mudif, the first uh, traditional Iraqi guest house made from Frakmites reed grass, the first one built outside of Iraq in 5,000 years of building Wadifs. Um, so Wadif had a tough winter 
Uh, it's not doing well, as you might, it's meant for arid climates. Um, and so we're actually gonna be deconstructing it uh, on a thoughtful process uh, on Memorial Day weekend. And we're inviting Iraqi immigrants to Philadelphia to join us with veterans of the Iraqi war. So they'll be working together uh, on deinstalling the motif. It was moving that they together broke around a year ago on Memorial Day is more that we'll be taking it down. So do check that out on our calendar events. We do operate the only wildlife clinic in the city of Philadelphia, one of the few in the region. As we say every week, uh, this is baby animal season. So baby squirrels like this one are almost literally pouring into the clinic every day. So this is their, this is their Christmas season. They're hyper busy right now, uh, hand feeding baby squirrels and baby birds soon coming soon thereafter. Um, as we'll learn next week, we are the place where Bird Safe Philly volunteers bring uh, stunned birds. There are volunteers who walk through Center City, Philadelphia, looking for birds during migration season who have hit um, glass buildings and are stunned. Um, they also collect the ones that have died, as you will learn, um, and bring those to the Academy of Natural Sciences uh, for study. But the ones who are stunned, volunteers drive up to our wildlife clinic, and we have an 80% success rate in returning to the, the um, to the wild, releasing the ones that come to us, like this evening growth speak. So you'll learn more about that next week. We're in the middle of toad detour season. Volunteers, Sarah, you're gonna like this. Um, Sarah doesn't know our, our geography. We're, we are a giant 300 acre rectangle of land. And one border of our rectangle is Port Royal Avenue. On the other side of Port Royal Avenue is a, a reservoir, an abandoned reservoir that's become a park. The toads wake up in our forest and they want the water in the reservoir to go mate. So they are compelled to do that. And they wanna do that um, the first cold, um, for the first wet, warm, wet rains of spring, late March, early April, they go. Uh, but of course they do that during, oftentimes during, uh, the rush hour when people are trying to get home. So more than 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, um, a volunteer started and then we picked up a program where we actually have permission to close the road and our volunteers help those toads cross the road. And so far, 1,000 of so our volunteers have ushered 1,000 American toads across <laughs> Port Royal Avenue, which is really cool. So they have their own Facebook page. Uh, go to Toad Detour on Facebook and you'll find them. It's really a remarkable thing. And, and when, it, when the toads are moving, it's, it's an epic migration. It's really, it's like our Serengeti. Um, and my favorite always is when a large female is lumbering across Port Royal Avenue trying to get to the water with a male already hanging on. So she's dragging him across the street to get to the reservoir. He's not letting go. Uh, we're in the middle of our native plant season as well, uh, native plant sale season. So do check that. It's online. Um, so check out the native plant sale online, order and come to the Nature Center and pick it up. Love for you to do that. We are uh, lots of volunteers. I mentioned Toad Detour, uh, volunteers like the Philly Fanatic. Uh, help us on Earth Day, planting trees, this is two years ago. We also are a membership-based organization. If you're a member, thank you so, so much. We really appreciate your membership and thank you for your support. Um, members get advanced notice of programs like, like this one. And again, Earth Day Live is next week. So hope you come back for that. But we are here tonight to be biking with butterflies. And I wanna introduce Sarah Dykeman to you. You can see on your screen now, outdoor educator, Sarah Dykeman, did something no other human ever even thought to do. Bicycle more than 10,000 miles to follow the annual migration of the monarch butterfly from winter in Mexico to summer in Canada and back again to Mexico. She's now the author of Bicycling with Butterflies, the delightful book that recounts her adventure, part memoir and part science book. She's also the founder of beyondabook.org, which challenges learners to get beyond books and is a fierce champion of monarch butterflies. Sarah, welcome, so glad you're here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. I was, I'm so impressed by the list of things you all are doing. It's, it's very inspiring. I'm like, while I was listening to the talk, I was like, oh, I, I gotta, yeah. I gotta think of some, some way to get there to help and a ways to incorporate some of those where I'm living. It's really, well, inspiring. next time you do your trip, come through Philadelphia. <laughs> sure. Come it's a during toad miles, season. No <laughs> yeah, right. yeah that's, that sounds amazing. Anyway. Well, I'll, I'll turn it over to share your screen. I'm so glad you're here and welcome to Philadelphia virtually. Awesome, well, thank you. Yeah, so like Mike said, tonight I'm gonna to be talking about my bike tour following the monarchs. So I'm gonna do a little primer on monarch ecology and then a little bit about bike touring and then tell some stories from the road and kind of some lessons I learned. And 
I kind of like grazed the surface. There's so many things I could talk about. So if I say something and it sparks your curiosity, I'm happy to dive dive deeper at the end. So throw throw um, comments or questions in the chat, like Mike said. I and mean, then with that, I'm gonna actually just jump right into sharing a screen, get the real star of my tour up there. This is a male monarch. And you can tell he's a male because he has these scent glands on his hind wings there. And wow, I just have, I have a million things to say about monarchs and how much I love them. And one is just their striking beauty. And this male monarch happens to be nectaring or drinking nectar from a swamp milkweed. And milkweed is the other hero of the story. Milkweed is the only food source of monarch caterpillars. So the females will lay eggs on milkweed of all sorts of species. There's over 70 in North America. Monarchs use most of those as host plants. And then the milkweed is actually poisonous. So it gets its name milk, because if you tear a little piece of the leaf, this milky latex will ooze out. And that's actually the plant's defense mechanism. But monarchs will be able to eat milkweed and store that def those defensive compounds in their body, and that renders them uh, poisonous or toxic. So this bright orange monarch is warning potential predators. I ate milkweed when I was a caterpillar. It's best to stay away. So milkweed, and like you, you literally cannot talk about monarchs without talking about milkweed. And you can't really talk about milkweed without monarchs. They're, they're linked and yeah, both, both are important. And I was advocating for both on my trip. So I decided to ride my bike with monarchs to, to pretty much be a publicity stunt, right? People see this monarch in their yard and they're like, oh, that's a pretty monarch, pretty butterfly. But then they see me bike up to their house and they're like, you biked here from Mexico? And I'm, and I'm like, yeah, and so did that monarch or maybe their grandma um, came from there. So it was really just about calling to attention this beautiful migration, this beautiful insect and how we can all help, help this butterfly. So I'm kind of jumping all over the place Let's actually start with a little bit of ecology. And I, I think the most important thing to note is the monarch's range. So this is a range map. Don't, don't worry if you, can't, if you can't see all the little details. The important part is that this map is colored, has four colors. Yellow is where the monarchs spend the summer months. Green is where they spend the spring. Orange is the fall. And there's a few little tiny dots of blue. That's where they live in the winter. Now you'll see the Rocky Mountains, they divide the population in half. So we have Eastern monarchs that are east of the Rockies, and then we have the Western monarchs that are west of the Rockies. And most of the Western monarchs overwinter in the coast of California. And then the Eastern monarchs, most of them overwinter in the state of Michoacan in Mexico in, in Mexico. You'll see there is some blue with a question mark in Florida. I could speak to that if someone's interested and we have time later, but mostly the monarchs of the East go to Mexico. And this is kind of, this was the focus of my trip. Now, what is really wonderful is that you'll, you'll see that in Mexico, the monarchs are so clustered together that their, their collective weight can actually bend branches or break branches, but then they really spread out. And people always ask, why did I follow monarchs? And, and like, I think sometimes my answer isn't satisfying because like, honestly, my, my heart and soul belong to frogs and toads. I love them so much, but frogs and toads, their migrations are fairly short and they really need fairly pristine habitat. They're not going to be in the suburb where all of the meadows and all of the wetlands have been filled in. That's different from the monarch though. The monarch is so democratic. The monarch is happy in rural America and populated cities along the sides of roads, behind schools and backyards and public parks, like you name it. If there is native plants, there are monarchs. And it really brings all of North America to get together. There's, just, there's not, a, not a lot of species that people across the country can all rally behind. And so I really, I've come to see the monarch as this uniter and this democratic insect that lets everyone participate. And also it just makes it so easy to bike. So when I say I was on the route of the monarch, I was on the route of one of millions of monarchs typically. I usually only saw a few a day, 
But like, as long as I was in Texas in the fall and spring, I was on the route of the monarch. As long as I was in Pennsylvania in the summer, I was on the route of the monarch. So I had lots and lots of options. The other amazing thing about the monarch migration is that the spring migration advances at about 60 miles a day. So a typical monarch might not go that far, they might go more, they might go less, but the migration as a whole advances at about the same pace a cyclist goes. So I, I try to go about 60 miles a day. Um, actually, I could just go right to my route now. This is the route I did, that red line. I started in Michoacan in March, and I traced my way north through the mountains into the Midwest. I stopped in my hometown of Kansas City to fuel up at my parents' house, and then went through the um, southern, southern Canada to the East Coast, did a quick little loop. I say little in quotes. Um, back to my hometown and then back through Mexico. And this route is 10,201 miles, give or take a few feet. I had a little computer on my bike, so that's about as accurate as I'll get. And it took about eight and a half months. So I left in March and I finished at the end of November. And the migration actually finishes usually at the beginning of November, right around Day of the Dead, but I was slower. Although this section of Mexico is when I probably saw the most monarchs. So there were lots of stragglers and it was like, it was so fun to see one and be like, we're almost there, we can do this. So I really, I really felt like the Monarchs and I were a team during this, this trip. The only other thing I'd, I'd like to mention about the, the ecology of the Monarch for this, this moment in time is that the Monarchs I left with in March were not the same ones that I finished with. And I think that's what makes them, oops, makes the Monarch migration so unique and and so incredible is that I, um, it takes about three to five generations to make this full loop. So the monarchs I was seeing in Indiana in the fall, I, I would look at like an egg and I'd think, wow, did I see your great grandma in Mexico? Or, or did you, did your mom pass me by, you know, on, on the side of the road or wherever, or, or so on and so forth. And I just think it's another way that the monarchs bring us together because there's undoubtedly monarchs that you all have seen that, that have connected you to places in Texas and in Canada and Mexico. So we really all are connected by monarchs. And, and in fact, Mike and I were talking before, there's people during this presentation that are from all over and there's just this, such a strong community of monarch stewards. And once you start helping monarchs, you really are part of something huge and strong and, and wonderful. So I encourage everyone to, to get involved. So a bit about bike touring. This is me on my bike. You can see my bike is nothing fancy. It's an old steel frame mountain bike that I, I built up. And some people are like, oh, that's right. You biked on that. But there's a couple really good advantages to a bike like this. One is it's super reliable. Like it's it's heavy, it's strong. It, I'm, I'm not too stressed about anything breaking and it's easy to find parts. And then the second thing is I can put this bike in front of a grocery store to go buy some groceries. And I don't have to worry too much about someone deciding that they want to take it. So it's a little bit of theft prevention. And on the bike, you'll notice I have these bags. They're called panniers. The front bags are store-bought and they're waterproof. And in them, I store my sleeping bag, sleeping pad, a book, journal, light, computer, and wallet, phone, stuff like that. And then in the back here, these are actually made from old kitty litter buckets. So they cost about $4 to make and they're recycled and they're also waterproof. And I, in them I store my cook, cookware. The red bag on the, on the top is my tent. That blue thing is actually a little folding, fold out couch. I call it a couch, it's, it's not a couch, but might as well be. And then I have my tools for minor bike repair, uh, a little bit of warm gear I couldn't fit in the front, spare water, et cetera. I had a tripod too. That's where all the photos are, have, have been taken from using my tripod. But this setup, there's lots of different ways to bike tour. Some people stay in hotels, some people stay in campgrounds. The, the way that I traveled, I was very self-contained, which meant I just had so much freedom. And that freedom allowed me I think a lot of a really great opportunity. And the first was 
I could just eat when I was hungry. Uh, so convenient. So I'm hungry, pull over, cook a meal, have a snack, you name it. And I could also camp when I was tired, when I was ready to call it a day. I never paid to camp. I always just found a spot on the side of the road. This this is a like the most classic spot. This is in Texas. You can see my tent there, and then the the highway is right there. And Texas has is is very intense about private property, as you could imagine. So I kind of just had to find these like places hidden and hidden in plain sight right on the on the highway easements there. And people are always like pretty worried about me in these moments, but I felt so safe camping like this. I think I felt way safer doing this than if I had gone to a public campground because public campgrounds, there's roads to them. People are loitering. You don't know what you're going to expect. But on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, far from a town, there aren't many people wandering around there. And if there is someone or if someone in a car sees me, I guarantee they're more scared of me than I am of them. And they'll just keep driving. Don't want to don't want to mess with that lady. So I thought I did feel really safe. The other advantage, of course, is of, of this way of, of camping is it's super easy to clean your house. <laughs> That's my favorite joke. <laughs> no one laughs, but man, I do not delete it. Um, the other great thing about, about bike touring is it's, it's so easy to stop on the side of the road and you're noticing the tiniest little creatures. So it, it made me so happy to hear about the American toads getting safe crossing. I have cried on the side of the road over so many um, killed, killed animals. I don't call them roadkill, I call them car kill. And I try and move them off to the shade. And when I find somebody alive on the side of, or on the road, it makes me so happy to be able to move them off to safety. And I, I do a little, please, please, please stay off the road and do not go on the road. But this little, um, little toad was was crossing the road and I grabbed him and I took some pictures and I just got to have this moment if I'd been in a car by the time I found a safe spot to pull over and I'd gone back the, the toad would probably either be squished or gone or I would have just decided ah, it's, it's too hard and not safe to stop so biking just really lets you meet lots of creatures and and my trip was about butterflies but it really was about all of the animals that share the habitat with monarchs. And one of my favorite stories from the road was actually, let's see, I kind of had two experiences with this animal. Um, the picture that I'm gonna show is from when I was in Canada, but the story I'm gonna tell is from New York. And I'd, I'd been biking and I love biking at night. It's when all the nocturnal animals I love come out. And so I stopped to turn on my light and I heard like some rustling in the, in the leaves in the grass and I stopped and and then with this was not the same exact picture I, it was at night so I didn't take a picture but a little skunk popped out of the woods and my first reaction was like oh this is so cool and then my second reaction was like oh yeah and so of course it wasn't graceful at all I like I literally screamed and then the skunk kind of jumped and we both ran thank thankfully but it's like these little moments, you can't predict them. Of course, I couldn't be like, I wanna go see a snake or a skunk tonight. But by just being out there on the road, you kind of just invite opportunity and you won't know what it is until it, it happen, you happen upon it. But th these are the moments that make bike touring, for me, worth it. Another great thing about bike touring is the people you stumble upon. So I this was a picture from, a a road in Mexico it was so hot and quite frankly really really boring <laughs> and I was basically just counting down the miles to make this turn and it, it must have been oh it was definitely over 100 degrees and this motorcycle I like watched this guy getting closer and I'm noticing he's slowing down and my first reaction is like oh boy here we go um, but luckily for me I he didn't read my mind and he ignored my doubt and he stopped and then he was like hey do you want some ice cream and my number one bike touring rule is if it's safe say yes don't worry about trying to get to this certain place at a certain time on a certain day by saying like the important thing is to say yes so because I didn't have an exact spot I needed to get because I didn't have an exact deadline for when my trip needed to end 
I could like take these moments and I could take 20 minutes or 30 minutes or two days in some cases to, to enjoy the opportunities that came. And like, I don't remember a single thing that happened between this, this man and that turn other than that was hot. And if I hadn't said yes, I probably wouldn't even remember this interaction, but because I said yes, that that's where the stories are. The stories are in the, in the moments you say yes. It wasn't just, of course, random hospitality I found. During my tour, I stayed with 68 people, 68 families, excuse me, on my trip. And when I wrote the acknowledgements in my book, I wanted to include them all for obvious reasons. And my first, my, my first draft of my acknowledgements was like 14 pages in Word. So it was like 40 pages. And my publisher was just like, you can't. If you can't have a book, your acknowledgements can't be longer than your book. So we we compromised. I was still able to list everyone. And like, these are the people that made my trip possible. And of all the 68 families, I included this picture because I, I just love the metaphor. In the, in the foreground, this is Margaret. She's uh, works on a, or she lives on a dairy farm. She was like a friend of a friend that invited me to stay. And then she asked me if I wanted some homemade ice cream from her dairy cows and of course I said yes but then in the background she's feeding the monarchs so there was this beautiful realization I had while I was biking that that even though the monarchs and I were on had different trips we really were finding victory in the same way so when I found a camping spot I know that the monarchs had those same times where they also like found the perfect spot for the night and then I also, I'm sure that there were the nights where they flew and they couldn't find what they needed. Just like I might have to bike an hour or two extra trying to find a place and then the place not being that good and me not feeling totally comfortable. Um, maybe not for safety, but maybe just for like the hill side or steep or whatever. So it, the same with this. I know there were, there were nights where I would show up and like I would get pampered by someone, by a family. And same with the monarchs, they would arrive at these people's houses and they would have everything they needed. So I really do feel bonded to the experience of the monarch. And I think all travelers can relate to this. And I think that's something we forget when we think about migrat migratory animals is we think, oh, we need to save their habitat in Mexico or oh, we need to save their breeding habitat up north. But if they don't have a safe spot every single day in between, then they're not then it doesn't matter if they have the habitat where they're where they're overwintering or where they're breeding so travel i think travelers understand this and i think biking the way i did really really brought attention to this now the other reason that bike touring was so good for the monarchs is it gave me lots of time to study the environment and to learn about monarchs so i i learned from scientists, I learned from stewards, I learned from citizen scientists, from teachers, from landowners, from farmers. And then I learned from the monarchs themselves. So I spent so many, so many hours looking for milkweed. And this is a, a classic example of some roadside milkweed. That's, that's me, I'm staging this photo, but I've spotted some milkweed in this, in this photo and I'm like leg literally jumping off my bike as the bike comes to a, a halt, because I'm so excited. And then I'd throw my bike down and then run to the ditch. And I spent hours and hours in ditches. At least twice, I would look up and there'd be a line of cars that had stopped to like come to my rescue. One time I looked up, there was a cop car that people had been calling to say there was a cyclist that was crashed in the ditch. But no, I was just crawling around, noticing things, noticing creatures. And this is a little common milkweed. And I spotted this, this milkweed. And then once I see a good milkweed stand, I'll kind of slow down and really start looking. And I'll zoom in on this milkweed here. On, on the plant was this little caterpillar. And this caterpillar was, you can see in their mouth, they're actually holding a piece of their frass, which is a scientific way of saying poo. And they were throwing the frass over their leaf. And I have a feeling that it has something to do with, with predator avoidance just like I think a predator might notice the frass and then look for the caterpillar, it's kind of a clue. That's kind of how I did it too. I saw the frass first and I thought, oh, that means there's a caterpillar. So by kind of cleaning up a few leaves, it might make it a little bit harder for a predator to find him or them. Now, the, 
the great thing about this is I I really trained my eyes to see like a mon to see the world like a monarch would. And I got really good at spotting caterpillars at 10 miles an hour. The downside of this is I saw all the moments that weren't victories for monarchs. I saw all the lost opportunity. And I saw, quite frankly, the devastation that humans have have put on the prairie and the monarch's home. And it was hard because I fell in love with the monarchs on this trip. Uh, and I was rooting for them and they were my they were my team. And so to see stuff like this happening to your team was was really hurtful or it was painful is the right word. And so this was a stretch of road that was clearly the last monarch habitat. Everywhere in between was was farms. And it's the last little stretch. And then we we can't even give the monarchs that. We have to mow it. And there are ways to mow if they had mowed earlier in the summer and then and then left it during the breeding season, that would have been a solution. Or just starting to see the prairie as beautiful and starting to see the quote weeds as, as habitat are both solutions to this issue of just humans needing to control everything and humans forgetting that, that we share the planet. And that's that was really the takeaway of the trip for me is every day, every mile, I saw places that used to be prairie. And I saw huge, vast stretches of land where we stopped sharing. And in all of these pictures in front of schools and suburbs, even these, this is a monoculture cornfield. In all of these cases, people are, are trying to be good neighbors, but they're only being good neighbors to humans. And what we need to remember is that we have to be good neighbors to the toads. We have to be good neighbors to the frogs and to our bird neighbors and our snake neighbors and our insect neighbors and our plant neighbors. And until we can start to see all of nature as our neighbor, then we're gonna keep failing them. And so I'm not saying we have to dig up every single inch of grass, although if you ask me, that would be great. What I am saying though, is we have to share. So we, we can't have just grass. We can't have just cornfields. We can't have just paved roads and, and lawns in the suburbs we have to share. And the reason for this is fairly stark. This is a graph of the monarch population. There's lots of numbers. Don't worry about them again. Mostly I wanna to call to attention the trend. So monarch populations, or, or excuse me, all wildlife populations over time fluctuate. So there'll be a good year, then a bad year, then a good year, then a bad year. But over time, the line levels out. And if you look at this graph, you'll see, yes, there's the good years and the bad years, but over time, it's not a level line, it's actually a downward line. So that downward trend that's been happening since, basically since GMO crops came into existence is, is downward. And this downward line is, is because of habitat loss. If you think about there being millions of monarchs and half of those are female, each female will lay between three and 500 eggs, about obviously with a million, there's going to be extremes on both sides but they don't want to lay just one egg per plant because if they lay only one if they lay 500 eggs on one milkweed those caterpillars will eat it like that so instead the females will try and lay one egg per plant which means if you have if you have millions of females and they each need 500 milkweeds you start start seeing how much milkweed we need i mean we need literally billions of stems of milkweed. And every time we lose those, well, that's less opportunity for monarchs. So habitat loss is the issue here. Climate change is becoming more of an issue as well. The other thing to, to note on this is there's that green line. This is the amount of monarchs that scientists have identified as a sustainable population. So that means that there could be a storm in Mexico and it won't kill, or, you know, if if it's a big um, event that kills lots of monarchs, there'll still be enough to rebound. Or maybe there's a bad year in the north, there'll still be enough to rebound. We haven't reached that sustainable level in many years. So it's kind of like we're on pins and needles waiting for that moment where the monarchs can't recover. And again, we've got to get more milkweed into the world so that the monarchs have the opportunity to build their population back up. So I say all this and I can like feel my blood pressure, like I start talking faster and louder and I start 
getting like warm and nah, I get mad. I get mad seeing this. And I was so mad on my trip, way more than I think people thought. They're like, oh, you're biking with butterflies. You must always be happy. I wasn't. And I had these moments of like real doubt and real, real anger and despair. But if, but I didn't just have that. Cause if I did, I, I, I would have just given up. I, I would say that the despair was countered by hope and I would go back and forth. And it was this, this balance of trying to find a place where I could be in the middle and I could remember the issues but and fight for solutions and not give up. And the way I did that was twofold. One was by doing something. I, I truly believe if you're doing anything to help the environment, anything at all, that feels like a win and it feels empowering and it is, it's such a good way to start. If you can do one step, then you can do two. So for me, that was giving the monarchs my voice. And I continue to do that. And I've been amazed that people will listen. And I'm so grateful for the monarchs. I, I love this idea that the monarchs gave me the idea for this bike ride and then I gave them my voice. And so they turned around and they gave me invitations to 68 homes. So I gave them even more of a voice by writing a book. And then they gave me opportunities to meet people and to do presentations and to make a living. And the monarchs and I, we just go back and forth thanking each other and working for each other. And, and this brings me a lot of joy and a lot of, a lot of responsibility and, and a lot of hope. And the other way that I manage is, is by just being inspired by people. And on my trip, I found inspiration in every state. And I am so grateful for those moments. And I'm gonna run through a few of them because we could all use, use that. The first was, well, not the first, but the one I'll, I'll talk about first was in Omaha. I stayed with a, a teacher there and she had started this, this small little garden at her school. And after a presentation, we went to the garden and we found eggs on the milkweed and we saw a, a male monarch fly over our heads and like, just like hearing whatever it was, 25 third graders, like scream with joy at this passing monarch. Oh, it was wonderful. And these school gardens are so important. And if you are live near a school or if someone you love is in school, try and get one of these gardens started. They're so hard to, to do. You have to convince administrators, you have to maintain them. It's really, really a lot of work, but the reward is really profound and really important because the more kids that have a moment with a monarch, the more, the better the monarchs will be, the better the kids will be, the better the world will be. Um, another source of inspiration was when I stayed at the Native American seed farm with Bill and his family. He started his career planting like Bermuda grass in Texas. And one day he was like, what am I doing? So he started growing natives. And 30 years later, he grows milkweed literally in rows like corn and collects the seeds as well as seeds from all over Texas and then sells them so that more people can plant natives in Texas. And I, the only people I stayed with on the southbound and northbound route were my parents and Bill. and and his family. There were all these other little moments like where I would just be biking. This sign says native prairie, no mowing or spraying. And it was like, oh, it's just like the weight is lifted off my shoulders to know in this world, this was in Iowa where 99.9% .9 of remnant prairie is gone. And so where, where there's these little, these little places where the monarchs can still find refuge, just like, oh, you know, just a way to, to buoy my, my soul. <laughs> And then meeting people like this is Diane and, and Sioux City. And I, I include a couple stories from Iowa because Iowa was really tough for me. It was full of really incredible people, but like I said, it's it's pretty much void of monarch habitat in most ways. That used to be the center of the monarch breeding grounds. And it's kind of, the monarchs have kind of had to shift to other places because it's mostly corn now. But then there'd be these little pockets. And in the 80s, she and some of her friends fought for this little little bit of prairie. And so when I was touring it, like I just I remember I found this little this little um uh, I can't think of the snake, ringneck snake. And I just thought like this snake would not exist without this work. And it was such a fresh of breath of fresh air because there are so many people her age that would just look at me and be like, when I was a kid, I used to see lots of monarchs. 
And that just got so old and it made me so mad. And, but then I'd find this person who was like doing something, who was saying, yeah, I used to see a lot and I'm going to fight and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I'm not the last generation that gets that. And wow, like that's what we need. We all need to be trying. We all, we just need to be trying. And then there's the gardens. I'm going to see what time it is since I want to make sure there's room for questions. All right. Well, I'll go slow through the garden section because this is like the most important section. And then I might kind of breeze through the rest. This is uh, Amy's garden in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this is like the perfect example of sharing. She's got green grass for the kids and the dog, the patio, the ornamental plants, and then she has some common milkweed. And when I showed up to her house, my first thought was like, okay, I guess there's some milkweed. And then she said, I'd already seen, she'd already seen 40 eggs on her milkweed plants. And if even just one of those eggs survives, well, that's 500 more eggs in the next generation. And if just a, a couple of those survive, that means thousands of more eggs by the time they reach Philadelphia. And so there's like a good chance, okay, a small, a small but very likely chance that one of you has seen an, a monarch that exists only entirely because of this garden. And, and vice versa, right? That, that there's a, there was a, a butterfly that visited her garden that exists only because of your all's efforts. And wow, that's just so amazing. Now, don't stop at a little tiny garden. That's a good starting place, but my favorite, favorite garden was Nadia's in, in Columbia, Missouri. And I didn't even take a picture, like you can't even see most of her yard. You can get, you can get an idea of it. It was the front and backyard were just, a prairie. It was so spectacular. There were walking sticks and birds and caterpillars and chrysalids and it was truly inspiring. And, you know, we often think, oh, the natives need to go in the backyard, but what we need is to bring them in the front yard and we need to make them the center and we need to showcase them as beautiful because that's how we're going to change the paradigm. That's how we're going to start to see these native or these grassy wastelands as, as just that, a waste of space, a waste of energy, a waste of water. And so we need, we need people like Nadia on every street to be that first brave person. You have to be so brave to plant those, those plants in your front yard and, and let the idea take hold. And my favorite part about this picture is there's this little common milkweed in her neighbor's yard. And I asked Nadia about it and she said, well, her neighbor used to mow everything. And then they learned that without milkweed, there's no monarchs. So they started mowing around this little clump of milkweed. And this is how it happens. It happens so slowly and so like almost unnoticeably, but this is how ideas spread. This is how milkweed spreads. This is how we save the monarch doing this, these small little tiny steps. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through kind of quickly show some pictures and show just a few little, a little I guess lessons I learned. And, and the first one, this is a picture from Mexico when the monarchs are clustering on the branches. And I love this picture because it showcases how densely clumped the monarchs can be. But in the background, I chose this one because you'll see this little tree here. It's actually bent from the weight of monarchs. And I, I mentioned before the monarchs will cluster, it takes about four monarchs equal the weight of a dime but they'll cluster so densely together that they can break branches. And, and this is like obviously kind of a tiny little tree or branch, but if it was just one monarch, that tree would be, you know, it would, it would be unnoticeable. But when we get lots of monarchs together, it, it bends trees. And so it's the same with us, just Nadia out there, just Bill, like just one of us, it's not gonna make a big difference. But when all of us are doing something like, huge change can come. Like we can metaphorically bend trees. And the same goes with our voices. This is what the monarchs look like when, when it's sunny out in Mexico. Uh, a a sunbeam will land on a cluster and then they'll all kind of warm up in unison and then they'll kind of erupt into the sky. And it's one of the most phenomenal things I've ever seen. But the best, best part is that you can hear their wings flapping. So you can close your eyes and you can like hear their song. And again, it's the same. If it's just me talking, a few people might hear, but not many. But if I'm talking and you're talking and 
I'm, Margaret is talking. I'm trying to think of who was in my presentation. If all of us tell someone and then they tell someone, then it, then it adds up. And it's so important that we become the voices for the animals that matter, right? The toads can't call city call and say, it's important that we be able to cross the street. The monarchs can't run for president and say, I, I need us to plant milk or we need to plant milkweed for our babies. Like that is our job. We have a voice and we need to give it to these creatures that bring us so much joy. And it doesn't matter where you live. This is a monarch in Manhattan. I mean, it's just so beautiful. They come, they come to us if we invite them and they're, they become guides. So it's so easy to fall in love with an adult butterfly, but then they, and they ask you, hey, slow down, go look for my eggs and caterpillars. And you do, and you discover them and you find the beauty in the, small, the smallest creature. There's that little milkweed sap, little, little caterpillar on some common milkweed. And then you start to notice the other animals that depend on milkweed. These are our milkweed tussock moths. And unlike a bright orange monarch adult, the adult tussock moth is a drab color because they're nocturnal. So having bright orange adult coloring would not help a nocturnal animal. Instead, these moths have actually adapted or evolved um, aposematic sound. So they have a little clip clicking sound that warns bats that they are toxic. So cool. And then you'll start to notice the googly eyed spiders and all the ants and wasps that predate on, on butterflies. And some people think, oh my gosh, we have to save monarchs. Let's bring them inside. Let's, let's rear them in cages and nets. For me, that's not the answer. It's fine to do that for a few so that you can watch the process, but we need to have 500 eggs on 500 milkweeds and we need 95% of them to get eaten because that's how we're gonna feed the birds and the toads and the snakes. So we need those monarchs to become part of the food chain, but we need 500 for each monarch female so that there's plenty of opportunity for a few to survive. And you'll notice the other pollinators and even the, the frogs that depend on milkweed, this little, little frog was in a common milkweed leaf. And so it, you don't have to give your, your life to monarchs. Pick whatever creature brings you the most joy and then go fight for them. Because when you fight for frogs, you are in essence fighting for all creatures. And if you fight for milkweed, you're, you're helping all the creatures. So it just matters that you, that you pick one and then you become their voice and you rally for them. And so you don't have to quit your job and get lost in Mexico, um, but you can. And in fact, this, this road, I, I turned onto this road and I was like pretty sure it was, <laughs> I wasn't gonna make it to Canada, but lo and behold, I did. And the monarchs taught me so much and they helped me write a book and they've given me so much opportunity. And I'm, I'm so happy and grateful that I, that I can share it and that people show up to listen. Um, so all you have to do is to be part of this adventure is to, to plant milkweed. And if you do the real adventurers, which are the monarchs, um, they, they will come to you. So with that, um, my book is, is Bicycling with Butterflies. You can read it to learn, to learn more about the incredible ecology. There's so many incredible little secrets that the monarchs have. My website is beyondabook.org, where there's lots of photos from my trip, as well as previous trips I've been on that have nothing to do with monarchs and at the same time, everything to do with them. And yeah, if, if you have questions, um, throw them in the chat and I'm super happy to, to answer and, and go, go where the interest lies. So I'll, Thank you, Sarah. So I'll put your questions in chat and I'll, I'll um, moderate the chat and we'll share questions with her and throw in a few of my own as we go. So thank you so much. Thank you, really appreciate it. Um, I just finished the book today at lunch. So it's a wonderful book. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, Sandy wants to know, she goes right to it. Has climate change affected the monarch migration? Are they leaving earlier? That's an incredible question. That was a good softball for me. I'm. Uh, um... The, the short answer is, is likely yes, not just when they're leaving, when, if you think about all the, all the elements that have to line up. So the monarchs need to leave. Well, first they need two weeks of cold winter in Mexico to 
switch their navigational direction. So they come with their honing um, south and then the, there's actually the two weeks of cold. It takes about two weeks to recalibrate their internal compasses to head north. So they need to have a specific temperature in Mexico, not only to do that, but then to do things like survive. So if the temperature is too warm in Mexico, they will fly a lot more. They'll be more active since they're cold blooded. They'll burn lots more calories and they'll starve to death. There's not enough flowers in Mexico to feed all the monarchs. And in fact, the, the monarch migration, one of the really spectacular things about it is that in the fall, the migrants feed like, like no other. And they actually will arrive to their destination heavier than when they started, which is unique to migrants. And then they live off of that fat reserve all winter long. So if they arrive without enough, without enough um, fat reserves, or if it's too warm in Mexico, they'll burn them up and, and they won't be able to remigrate. And then of course, of the same aspect, if there's a fluke storm, which are becoming more prevalent with climate change, then the, there might be a, a freeze, which, would, which can kill many of them. I mean, a high percentage of a, of a population in the winter. The trees kind of act as a buffer in Mexico to avoid that. So the canopy is like a, a blanket and an umbrella to kind of protect them from the most extreme weather. But as the forest is, is cut down and as climate change becomes more extreme, those weather events, um, that isn't always going to be enough. And so, the, and then you think, well, then they have to get to Texas right as the milkweed is emerging. And then the milkweed is affected by drought. The quality of the nectar of the, of the nectar plants is affected by things like drought. The year I did my trip in 2017, there was a, a an unusually cold um, spring, which delayed the development of monarchs, meaning that instead of having five generations cycle through, which every single generation adds to the population since you're adding three or four monarchs um, to every 500 clump of eggs. Without, if you take out a generation that has a huge impact on, on the um, amount of monarchs at the end of the season. So there's, yeah, there's lots and lots of climate implications. And, and I'm actually doing a, a fun project. I'm about to, uh, this will be kind of my, my first announcement really, but I trained a bunch of um, women in Mexico. There's a dog out there. I trained a bunch of women in Mexico to count monarchs that are streaming. And it's a way to get um, a, an economy, a local-based economy that's science-based for, for people that wouldn't have that opportunity normally. And then they're, they're counting monarchs all, all season long that stream by their house. And um, I'm basically hypothesizing that as climate conditions warm there, there'll be more activity. And I'll be able to also see not just more activity at the overwintering sites, which would be detrimental to their fat reserves, but also a, a possible earlier migration in the spring. So yeah, lot, lots of really interesting pieces happening there. Thank you. Rebecca wants to know how monarchs know where to find food. They visit her little garden and enjoy the milkweed. And she's always amazed when none of her neighbors have milkweed that somehow they find hers. That, that is extraordinary to me as well. Like thinking about that garden in Omaha, where it's just like, I, I mean, I was lost getting to that school. It was just so much sub suburbs. And then this monarch finds it. Um, it's really extraordinary. The, as far as, as I know, the monarchs will use their eyes to kind of hone in on patches of green and then the they'll use chemical clues to like basically like kind of like smelling to to find the milkweed and then the females will do this interesting thing called drumming where on their arms they have like these little like hooks almost and they'll drum on the leaf and the the hooks or bars will kind of rip the leaf very very small but it's essentially like mowing the grass where you smell the grass that's been mowed they'll actually use that to kind of better increase the, the chemical clues that they're getting from to know if the milkweed is, in, is the proper milkweed. And then they kind of taste those chemicals with their feet. So they're using a few different um, cues to, to, to find the milkweed. Great. Keep the questions coming uh, at 7.56. We'll go to like 8.05, 8.10 if that's okay. Uh, but if you have to sign off earlier, we're so glad you're here and hope to come back next week with Earth Day. Uh, Red's going to bite. It wants to know about monarchs wintering in, Mex in Florida. Yeah, that's, that's actually kind of goes to the climate change um, topic as well. So 
basically the monarchs fly north um, each spring and then ideally they would almost want to stick to the upper midwest where it was it was historically prairie um, and the best conditions for for raising caterpillars then, but then the prevailing winds would push them east and so they'd sort of start to colonize the east and make it eventually to the eastern seaboard and interestingly enough when white um, colonialists came they started cutting down the eastern forests and the prairie kind of replaced the forest and the monarchs have kind of have have followed that disturbance east but they would every every season at least some of them will make it to the eastern seaboard and then when they fly they fly back another kind of interesting thing to think about is they're all getting an angle a bearing to go to Mexico which is going to be different in Minnesota versus um, the east so there's some interesting things happening there but the ones on the east they usually kind of follow the Atlantic Ocean and the Appalachian Mountains south before cutting across um, usually around in Georgia but some of them just keep going to Florida and they get to the bottom of Florida and they're kind of stuck there and it, they, you know, they haven't quite figured out they have to turn north to not have to cross the Gulf. And what happens is some of them stay there and historically there would be a frost, a, a few day frost in Florida that would, would kill all those monarchs. But as climate change warms the planet, those frosts are becoming less extreme and less frequent. And so some years those, I, I don't know, funneled monarchs, those lost monarchs will actually survive winter. And so the question mark is, is this population, what, what's happening with this population? How is it affecting the migrants? Um, and I mean, essentially no one knows for sure, but essentially that at some point that might become one of the overwintering, the permanent overwintering sites where monarchs go there. And I mean, you, we don't really know, like eventually in Mexico, it'll be too hot. So perhaps that will become the spot. I'm saying that not as a scientist, just as a curious person, you know, recognizing that these changes are gonna, can, things will continue to change and play out. You might've heard of this, but uh, for all the people on Zoom, I want them to know about this. Cape May is a hugely important place um, on, the, on the Jersey coast for monarchs and migration. So you, you wanna go down to um, Cape May Point State Park, uh, you know, September, October. Um, and there are bird watchers from Audubon who are watching all the hawks and, and migrating birds going by, but monarchs do the same thing. So the monarchs come down the East Coast and New Jersey it becomes its funnel, which goes right to Cape May, and they all wait for the right weather and then they, they jump um, the Delaware Bay. So it's uh, on your next tour, you have to come to, <laughs> to Cape May in the, in the fall. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I assume monarchs right now They've left Mexico, it's, it's late April, they're in the South and they're not yet in Philadelphia, but maybe there's a few pioneers who maybe are here. Do you have a sense yeah. of, if you're a Pennsylvanian, so when do we expect them? And also, is this the first or second generation after Mexico that would come here? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I'm actually, let's see if I, I'm gonna share a different screen. I pulled this up beforehand to see where the monarchs are. Is this, this journey is north? There this is go. Journey North website, Oops, excuse me. And you can go to there at journeynorth.org. And what's really cool about this is this is a citizen science tracking website. Yeah. And and so people will can submit their their sightings and this particular map is a first sightings. So it's a way of, to gauge the northern edge of the migration. And what you can do is you can go, you can go through this timeline here. And so this is the dots that you see right now, that, that yellow color, that's the monarchs that were first sighted before March 13, 14th. So you can see they've kind of um, begun to, well, you see there might be that Florida population as well as these monarchs in the South. These monarchs are likely the migrants. They arrive, you can tell them apart. It's pretty easy to tell apart because the overwintering generation has to live eight months about. So by the time they've made this epic journey, survived winter and then re-migrated, they are a tatter. They are barely any wings left. They're super sun faded. They've lost a lot of scales as well. So they look transparent and they just look like survivors. 
This is and the Methuselah they, generation is one of the names for them, right? Yeah, right. And it's also called the super generation or the overwintering generation. Um, and then those will lay eggs, they'll die. And then when those eggs metamorphose from caterpillar to chrysalis to adult, they're this bright orange. And you're almost like, wow, like it's so obvious that they're fresh and new. And those monarchs will only live about a month as an adult. So they live much less time during that whole time they're breeding and laying eggs. But if we go, if we continue to look, you can, you can watch the next week, there were more still in the South. Then they've started kind of going up into Arkansas. And then by April, that's the oranger dots. They're further north. And then that was, so as of through April 18th, so this week is kind of that most orangish color. You can kind of see where they are here. So they've, they've got a little bit longer to go. What's really cool is you can go to a different year and you can see when did they finally make it. Uh. So that's July. So I actually use this to plan my route in some ways. So it looks like you all should be seeing them by probably by, by May. That's great. Um, yeah, really, really cool. And you can add to this. So keep your eyes out. And when you see that first monarch of the season, you can submit it to Journey North and you can help help show these patterns. And what's really fascinating is, is going, scrolling, they've been doing this, you know, it looks like since 1998, you can scroll through and you can watch how, how weather and, and wind affect each year's migration. So it's not the same every year. And there's these cool patterns that emerge. Kathy just checked in and said she first saw monarchs in Denton, Texas, a couple of weeks ago. Texas is here. <laughs> yeah, Welcome, I Kathy. passed through Denton. <laughs> um, we're not going to lose monarchs because monarchs have a bigger distribution than this, and they're the monarchs from the west that go down to California. Um, but we're going to we, we're in trouble losing the phenomenon. Can you tease out? The, the difference there. So we're not gonna lose the species, but we're gonna, we may lose this unique phenomenon. Right, I mean, if like, again, I'm not speaking as a scientist here, but if the population overwintered in Mexico and maybe they just, they, they either stayed there all year or not, excuse me, not Mexico, Florida, they might just stay there all year. There might be enough milkweed where they would never become overwintering adults, so they would never go into sexual diapause, they would never have to hang from the trees and wait out winter, which is like one of the really amazing things about the monarchs, to think of this little tiny insect flying thousands of miles and then just, just surviving in a cluster of other monarchs for all of winter. And that's what we stand to lose, is that, that phenomenon of that, that overwintering phase. So that's even, we think that might be happening in California as the climate warms again, there's a certain temperature when the where the caterpillar the caterpillar has that simulates them to emerge as a non-reproductive adult and to, to wait for winter. If it's if it never gets cold enough for that, then they'll emerge as a reproductive adult, they'll mate, they'll lay eggs, they'll live a month and they'll die. And then that cycle will keep happening. So we call those resident monarchs. And there's also resident monarchs in in, in Europe like in the Mediterranean, like Spain, and then in New Zealand. So there's, there are these monarchs all over, but it's this, it's this multi-generational, multinational migration that we would, that we would lose. Right. They truly and are North American. That's great. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, for those of us who would love to see the monarchs in Mexico, what's the way to ethically do that? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, if, if you need to go with a guide, make sure the, the guide is try and find someone local that supports the local economy, which means you're staying at a hotel near the sanctuary, you're paying a guide that's local to, to bring you up to the colony, you're eating there. Um, you know, the, the, re, the, the situation in Mexico is, is so complicated, but if you think about it, basically that land those trees were, were given by the government to the people living there to create an economy. And then in, when the monarchs were discovered, the government said, nope, never mind. these trees are now protected, which took away, just stripped these people of their livelihood. 
And so the tourism has kind of helped supplement that. But if as long as only some of the people are getting rich off of monarchs, then there's the problem. And again, that was kind of where I was coming from when I designed my project to offer jobs to people that aren't in the tourist industry, because we have to create these economies so that there isn't the incentive to go in and steal a tree or take a lot of water. There's this recipe, there's this under, there's this understood reciprocity where the people understand that for them to have a living, the monarchs need to have a living. And so there's this give and take that's needed. Um, so finding ways to support that economy is really important. And yeah, I mean, it's complicated, right? Because traveling is, we, it gives us a carbon footprint. So I, I think finding ways to reduce your impact at home so that when you do make these trips, they're, they're less, less impactful. That's great. So, so what's next for you? I'm actually really excited that um, I'm working on a, ten, a version of this book for 10 year olds. Well, eight to 12 year olds, really. Uh, I left on my tour. I didn't really mention this tonight, but during my, my trip, I spoke at schools and I talked to about 9,000 kids during my, my trip. And so my target audience was fifth graders. I love talking to fifth graders. They're awesome. They ask the best questions. <laughs> no offense. They always ask where I go to the bathroom. They're the only, only people <laughs> brave enough to do so. But um, Okay, so, so where'd you go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> just like the animals in the woods. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I'm writing a book for them. Um, I'm really excited about it. And then I'm also brainstorming ways, trip ideas so that I can be a voice for the frogs. Um, I'm thinking of some like amphibious trip that's half land, half water, like an amphibian to explore different species rather than one migrant. So yeah, lots of ideas. That's great. Thank you. So the book is Bicycling with Butterflies, butter biking, right? As you, as you yep. called it. Sarah, thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you for everything. And everybody feel free to unmute yourself and thank Sarah for spending an evening with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's a good, a good read. A very thank good read. Book. Yeah, it is a good thank read. You. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We got some younger voices than we often do on a Thursday night. So that's thank you. You do it. You do it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you. Good luck. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Birthday. Good night. Bye.